Hi everyone, welcome to Homespun, where creativity finds its voice. I am your host, Misty Doan, and today I'm joined by Kira Delaney, who is a wonderful teacher, and she is gonna share her journey from the costume shop to teaching fiber arts of all kinds, and also encouraging more people to create. So be sure to join us. Hey everyone, welcome to Homespun. I am your host, Misty Doan, and I am joined by Kira Delaney. Kira, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, so tell everyone a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Sure, so I, um, I've always been crafty. Yeah. So I started crocheting when I was three years old. Oh my and gosh. Picked up knitting and embroidery and sewing and weaving and spinning. I think in that order, I might've gotten a little bit off. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, and now I am a pattern designer. I design both knitting and crochet patterns, and I also teach mostly knitting and crochet, the beginning levels of pretty much all the crafts. And this is the work that I do, which is really kind of wonderful. My full-time job now is being crafty and helping other people do it with um, less stress than there sometimes can be. That's amazing. And you work with kids a lot, right? I do, yeah. So one of my um, teaching gigs for 15 years now is teaching after-school programs in a middle school. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so I've got like 10 to 13 year olds and we do sewing and knitting and crochet and needle felting and embroidery. Then I also do private lessons with kids pretty frequently. That's so mm -hmm. great. And how wonderful that that's available to kids because so often, you know, we lose a lot of the arts and, you know, I can remember as a young girl loving family and consumer sciences where I got to sew and I got to be creative and, you know, play in the kitchen and do those things. And so to have that after school program available to these kids has to be a, a kind of a lifeline for them, I would think. Yeah, I think for some kids it's really wonderful. And yeah. sometimes it is kids who are like academically gifted and doing well. And some of the kids I've had maybe don't do as do academic classes as easily, but mm -hmm. they can come and just needle felt and have fun. Yeah. I mean, I was probably one of the last generations that had home ec in school and right. I had sewing class as an elective in high school, which I just took over and over and over. And I don't think that's available very often. Yeah, and it I seems wish... to be very rare now. Yeah, it'd be great if I could be there during the day for everybody, yeah. because not everyone's in after school, but um, right. it also means I get the kids who want to be in my classes, which yeah. is easier for me for one day. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. They're choosing to be there, which is kind of magical. Yeah, and some of them it's three years that yeah. they are in the class the whole time and they really know how to sew or how to knit or whatever they've been focusing on by the time they graduate. That's so great. What's mm -hmm. something you've learned in working with kids that um, surprised you? You know, what, one of the things I love about working with kids is that it's very different than working with adults, which I do a lot. Yeah. Because um, when you're 10, most things are still new to you mm -hmm. and you are learning new things all the time. And often you don't get a choice mm -hmm. about learning new things mm -hmm. and you're used to not being perfect right away. Yeah. But then if I have a classroom full of adults, it's a little harder. Like there's more emotions about like being good at it right away and doing it right. Um, yeah and being perfectly neat and even, which usually means they do everything way too tight. Uh, I am guilty of that. Me I too. will be the first to attest. <laughs> yep, me too. And then as a teacher, I make sure that I'm a student sometimes too, so mm. that I'm learning new things myself. And remember that discomfort that happens mm. when you're new and you aren't quite sure what's going on and you know it's not very neat and you have to just work through that. Yeah. So when I teach adults, that is part of my introduction to class is like, let yourself be a beginner. Yeah. It's gonna be a little uneven. That's where you start, that's where I started. You just got to practice to get through it. And I do not have to have that conversation with 10 year olds. Oh, <laughs> they just dive right in. That's so interesting. Cause I think as adults, we, we fall out of the habit of being constant learners, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're constantly learning, you understand that there's going to be failure involved. It's part mm -hmm. of the process. And so of course kids are more adept at that because mm -hmm. they're still in it. They're still learning all the time and are, are eager to learn those new things. And I, I actually think we all could do better about being eager to learn new things and gentle with ourselves mm -hmm. as we're, you know, working through that process. So a great reminder to all of us to be more like kids in that regard. Yeah. I mean, even if you're not a teacher, I feel like that's a good practice to yeah. be new at things. D and absolutely. There's some humility in it. And I've just gotten to the point where I can be new at something and not be good at it yet. And appreciate that as part of a step on the journey. Absolutely, because mm -hmm. that is part of the process. And most things, um, whether it's, you know, quilting, which I do a lot mm -hmm. of, or crochet and knitting or needle felting, it's a learned skill, mm -hmm. right? And so the longer you spend doing it, the the quicker you're going to develop that mm -hmm. skill and to be, feel confident in it, but it is a process and it takes time. For sure. So tell me more about the classes that you do for adults. So you teach online and in person? I do. I'm teaching a little less online these days okay. um, because 
especially with hands-on crafts, it's really helpful to see people's hands. Yeah. And you know, when I teach online, I've got a camera that's right over my hands. Sometimes I've recorded videos in advance so they can be more specific mm -hmm. where I'm not thinking about the chat or anything else at the moment. Um, but I do teach some online. I teach a lot in classrooms and I've got the middle school. I teach at a lot of the local yarn shops where I live in California. And about once a month, I will travel to a big fiber festival oh, and just awesome. teach for a few days That's... Um, a bit more intensely. And I have private lessons and a really big range of people that I meet with privately. That's so wonderful. Can you share a little bit about that journey from being a creative your whole life, loving working in these things and, and making a career of it? How did you get to that point? Yeah, so I was always crafty. And when I was in my teens, I kind of forced some of my friends to learn how to make things because I thought it was so important to make things. Yeah. And I remember giving certain people um, a choice, like I could teach you how to knit or I could teach you how to sew. <laughs> and neither was not an option that I gave. Yeah, and I've recently, you tell me which. <laughs> yeah, like you could choose, but from these options, yeah. and you're gonna learn to make something somehow. Um, and then I went to college for theater and I did costume design and costume construction. Oh, amazing. Yeah, because I'd already sewn a lot and I thought that would be interesting and I don't work in theater anymore, but through that I, you know, was designing and teaching people mm. and working in the costume shop and um, eventually I ended up working in a yarn shop for a few years. Okay. And there, you know, I started teaching the official classes, but also people walk into a yarn shop all day long, especially with problems mm. or stuck on a pattern or needing, you know, to know how to do a cable because they've never done that before and they just need to see it in person because this was before YouTube was sure. very popular. Um, and then from there, I started teaching at that shop and shifted into teaching at other shops. I also started publishing designs because I would make up patterns for myself or customize patterns that existed and folks would come in and they'd say, I'd love that sweater. I would like to make it. Yeah. What's the pattern? didn't have one. Yeah, so <laughs> you have a, to fill that gap. Yeah, so after a few years, I let them talk me into starting to write patterns. Um, yeah, and then it just gradually became more and more of the work that I do. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's always interesting how that uh, our lives just kind of take this meandering path to this, this beautiful place if we're willing to uh, explore those ideas. And I like that you didn't necessarily put yourself in a box. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for me, when I went to school, I was certain that I was going to do that like one specific thing and people always ask me they're like did you ever think you'd be a quilt teacher when you got older and I'm like no like there was never a part of my mind that thought that this would become my career did I grow up sewing and loving it absolutely but it was not a straight line to get here <laughs> at all and I think that's more common these days too oh than it absolutely used to be. It, yeah. it definitely is and I think it's it's a good reminder to all of us um I have a you know some nieces and nephews that are always worried about what their future holds and i'm like just do what is exciting and interesting to you in this moment and be okay with change that's the best advice i can give because um i think life can surprise you in, oh, in a re in a really good way yeah and everything you do along the way affects what you yeah. end up doing right yeah. like i don't work in theater anymore but it was really helpful for me to shop for and sew for and alter for a mm. wide variety of body shapes yeah so when i started publishing knitting patterns I had a really wide size range for the time. I love that, yeah. Those skills, because I hadn't even connected how those skills would really correlate, but you're right. When you're fitting all of these different people and then going to write patterns for different different bodies and different fits, it gives you that that you know knowledge that you need to really serve those customers in a way that is meaningful and helpful. So. Yeah, and I had things that I'd made up for myself that people were asking for a pattern and I didn't do some because I didn't make sense to grade up. Mm, and yeah. it wasn't going to put out a one size pattern. Right, yeah, three it, ne sizes it needs pattern. to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. All right, so tell me more about your design process and how you come up with patterns that you want to create and design. Yeah, it depends a little bit, like there's some variation, but I kind of have a lot of ideas in my head of, you know, different shapes that I want to do, maybe garments that I would like to have in my wardrobe, mm. um, or that I feel like aren't out there in mm. the, the pattern world for knitting or crochet but also techniques are really interesting to me. Yeah. So I would think about, you know, I haven't done anything with intarsia mm -hmm. in knitting, so I should probably come up with a pattern that is that technique, but feels like my aesthetic. Tell me what that yeah. means. <laughs> I don't even know that word. <laughs> so intarsia, um, think of it as like color blocking or picture okay. knitting. So that if you have a background, you've got a separate source of yarn for each, you know, spot that's in there, but also each section of the background. Okay. So I resisted doing it for a while because I grew up in the 80s and intarsia then was like floral sweaters mm. 
yeah. with a million yarn ends to weave in and it was just busy for me. Yeah. But I was teaching class on Antarja to a knitting guild and at the end somebody very helpfully raised their hand and asked if which of your patterns have Antarja, Kira? Mm. And I was like, actually zero. Oh. None. none. You're right, uh, I have and a I void should fix there. That. I yeah. should fix that. And then I had to sit with that and think about like what would look like my aesthetic and to mm. feel good and be something I would want to wear that uses that technique. And I came up with something with just a little bit of intarsia. It's like stripes that almost go to the end, uh -huh. but not quite. Yeah. And they're only every once in a while. So if somebody's nervous about the technique, it's just, you know, four rows every once in a while. Yeah. It's not hard to do. A good jumping off point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great. I, I can relate to that in what I do too. That as a teacher and a designer, I want to constantly be challenged. And I, mm -hmm. I'm sure you experience that same thing. You don't want to get too stale in mm -hmm. what you're doing. Yeah, and the teaching actually helps with the designing too because I look for what my students would want next. Right. Like this is a good intro. You took a class on the technique. Here are a few patterns that would be a next step where you can use it, but it's not diving into the deep end. So Kira, tell me how you got involved uh, with Missouri Star. So I was at a fiber festival last spring and Sarah Delaney came up and of course we almost share a last name. Uh, and she told me about this project that you're bringing in guest designers mm -hmm. to do the tutorials, which sounded fun to me. Yeah. And turns out that she's been lurking on my uh, Ravelry and other social media for a long time. <laughs> I just I got reminded of this yesterday. I was like, did you just meet me there and like invite me to do this whole big thing? Because that's kind of a, a lot for somebody you don't know. And she's like, oh, I know, I know who you were. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, but it was fun. And she's been just really lovely, like making this an easy an easy project to say yes to. Oh, so good. I enjoyed it. I'm so glad. Yes, yeah, Sarah's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So she's, she's a good one to, to count as a friend. Yeah. And it's so lovely too. I mean, a lot of quilters do crochet or knitting mm -hmm. because it's so much more portable than most styles of quilting. Exactly. And so especially if you're traveling, it's nice to have something small that you can just tuck in your bag and have something to do with your hands. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think in general, as a creative, we like to keep busy. We don't want to be sitting still. So being able to go into a yarn shop and touch all those beautiful yarns and, and figure out what you want to make is always exciting. Yeah, in some ways too, like knitting or crochet can almost be like a fidget toy mm. that then helps calm your brain calm your to brain. do other things. Yeah, like I knit through a lot of my college lectures. Mm. I had a, one particular teacher who would not let us take notes. <gasps> and the first day was so hard for me because I wasn't doing anything with my body mm -hmm. and my mind wandered more. So the next day I brought in my knitting needles and, and, just sat and there he knitting. was okay with that. He was not okay with that. Oh, no. <laughs> he didn't stop me. Okay. But he kept glancing over, and you know, this was a while ago, and I had metal needles, so there's probably a little clickety clack yeah, happening um, before wooden needles were very common. Mm -hmm. And so he just would like kept darting glances at me and was like visibly uncomfortable. And then he decided to stop me by firing questions at me, but oh. I knew all the answers. That's good. And so then he couldn't stop me. I mean, he could have, but he decided not to. Yeah. And so I knit through the whole semester. And wow. at the end, some of the TAs came up to me and they're like, we talk about you. <laughs> like, you are just so brave to do that. Like, he does not like it, but you are getting an A. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's so wonderful. I, I'm much the same, though. If I can't take notes, it's hard for me to retain the information to the same level that I would otherwise yeah. or, or have something to keep busy because it, my brain needs almost a little bit of distraction in order to focus on yeah. on what I'm doing. So uh, knitting, I, I often, if I have like a lot of computer work, I, I will make washcloths because mm -hmm. that's about <laughs> where my comfort level without having to count and think, like I can just work through it and, and knit a bunch of little washcloths and oh, yeah. um, that will keep me busy. Yeah, but great for that. Like but, I always like to keep an interesting project yeah. and an easy project and a portable project. And sometimes mm. that's 10 projects because they all got interesting that's or large. Right. <laughs> but like the washcloths are great too. Like yeah. you don't have to think about it. If you mix something up and you end up losing a stitch, it's not a big deal. It is not the end of the world. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So I, I do usually have one of those going at all times. And mm -hmm. I also have another knitting project that is in the bottom of a bag that I know I should go and finish, but now I just don't like it. I don't like the yarn anymore. <laughs> oh, give yourself permission to not finish <laughs> To just it. let it go. Yeah, you could just yeah. like disappear the whole thing or unravel it and then mm. you've got the pretty yarn again because you probably like the yarn at the beginning. Yeah. And actually, I've got a trick for that. Oh, what's if that? You were feeling bad about unraveling it, whether it's something you don't love anymore, mm. or you made a mistake and you just feel in your heart that you don't want to take it out and waste that time, mm -hmm. hand it to somebody else mm. and have them unravel it. And then you'll go to back as yarn and it is just a totally different feeling. That's a good idea. Yeah. And like, especially if you've got some kids around, you mentioned nieces and nephews, like mm. an eight or 10 year old 
loves to destroy things. <laughs> That's true. And so they'll destroy the knitting, but like teach them how to wind it into ball nicer, give them a ball winder sure. so they can play with the machinery as well. Yeah. Um, and then you'll find that you don't have the same emotional attachment mm. to having it disappear if you don't watch it yourself. That is some really good mm. advice. I bet my 13-year-old Ezra would just love that because he he is like an engineer brain and loves to take things apart and put it back together. So that yeah. is a very good tip. Maybe I'll do that. This, the never ending cowl, I like to call it, will maybe get a new home yeah. or a new life. You should get him into knitting or crochet or quilting as well because it's absolutely engineering. Yeah, I, I really know. should. He loves to sew. And mm -hmm. so he'll often sit with me in my sewing room and just cut shapes. And he likes to just do raw edge applique where he's just sewing it on top. He doesn't necessarily want to piece them together, mm -hmm. but he's creating artwork out of his fabric, which I really love. Yeah, I just reconnected with one of my students from the after school program uh -huh. who is now, I think, 24. And when they were 12, so 12 years ago, when they were 12, they were in my classes. And oh. I remember them like designing their own quilt. Yeah. And not all the kids want to quilt. A lot of them want to do smaller things or clothing, but this particular kid wanted to quilt and mm -hmm. also did a lot of knitting and now works as an engineer, which oh. was not shocking to me having known yeah. them when they were little. And um, had a conversation with all of their coworkers and they were discussing like what their childhood hobby was that led them to engineering. And there's oh. a lots of like, model trains and miniature airplanes and a remote control, this and that. And then um, my student was like, yeah, knitting, oh. sewing. I did all the fiber arts when I was a kid and it's related. It is related, absolutely. Yeah. So now they're like crocheting the parabolic spheres and oh. all kinds of cool stuff. That is amazing. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess I hadn't really considered this when you first mentioned that you work with these kids after school, mm -hmm. But do you kind of let them dictate what they want to do? So they are maybe not all doing the same project. Absolutely. Because I think that's so important for everybody to yeah. only make some things you want to do. So when I teach sewing, there is like a really simple tote bag that they do because okay. they learn seaming. We do a little gusset. So mm -hmm. sometimes they're sewing based on the machine guide. Sometimes they're sewing on a line. We do edge stitching. Mm -hmm. We get to that moment where you're lining a bag and it's all inside out and you have no idea how it's going to work. But then you trust the teacher that's right. and it works. Yep. Um, and that way I just know they have the basic skills. Okay. And then after that, wide open. I've got patterns. I can help them design something. Oh, how um, fun. And knitting crochet, I have, you know, four or five things. If I have 25 sixth graders on the first day, we do not knit or crochet. Okay. We do weaving or we make pom-poms because that's a lot easier. And then as they're ready for knitting or crochet, I can teach them a handful at a time. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's really wide open. And I've got kids now who are designing their own projects because they've been with me for years. Mm -hmm. And they, um, some of them ask for help and some of them just work on it on their own. And I might kind of wander by and ask a question that's going to like lead them. Oh, so what's your seam allowance? And then they'll realize they didn't actually add any seam allowance oh. yet. And <laughs> good thing it's still on paper. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. I, I love that that gives them kind of guidelines to get mm -hmm. started, but then gives them creative freedom as well to play and be creative and just enjoy the process because that's really what it's all about. I remind my students in classes a lot that if we're frustrated, we're missing the point mm -hmm. of the creativity, right? Like we have to be able to find joy in it and give ourselves enough grace to just enjoy the process and, and back it up and start over if we have to. And, and so when we get, we take it too seriously, what should be this beautiful, fun, relaxing and fulfilling hobby. And so keeping the joy in it is so important. I love that you're sharing that with future generations. How, how cool. So is there a project that you would recommend for beginners to get going and really love what they're working on? Um, so I just released a pattern collection for Missouri Star on hybrid crochet, which is a technique that's also called Tunisian crochet. Okay. Which I think is actually easier than traditional crochet stitches and easier than knitting. So if you're feeling nervous, it might be a really good introduction into crocheting. Ooh, wonderful. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, it's um, it's a technique where you use a long crochet hook and okay. every row you kind of go across and back before the row is done. And that lets you split up the work. So you do mm. what we call the forward pass where you're picking up loops on your long hook. So you do the same thing to every single stitch across the way. So you get repetition there. Uh -huh. And then you work those loops off. Okay. So you have the ease of knitting where you have a moment where you can stop and count. You've got loops on your tool. You can see if it's the right number. Okay. And then the wonderful benefit of crochet that if something is wrong, you don't have to know what's wrong. You can <laughs> just take out your hook, pull it back, go back to one loop and start fresh from there. Start over. Yep. That's wonderful. I, I am better at knitting. Mm -hmm. I must say I'm, I am adequate at knitting, <laughs> but I, I think I'll have to check mm -hmm. that out. That sounds like it could be right up my alley. The perfect segue to 
um, jump from knitting into crochet. Absolutely, because it feels like a mix of both. So yeah. a lot of knitters even do that organically in a beginning crochet class, mm -hmm. where normally crochet, we sort of resolve each stitch before we do the next one. And sometimes I'll turn around and a knitter will be sitting there with 10 loops on their hook. <laughs> and they weren't supposed to have 10 loops on their hook. But they, mm -hmm. but they made it happen. They wanted it. That's awesome. Yep. I love that. So tell people where they can find you if they want to learn more about your patterns and what you're working on. Sure. So um, I'm lucky that my name is kind of unusual. So uh, if you just Google Kira Knitting or Kira Crochet, you'll usually find me pretty fast. Okay. But my handle is Kira K Designs. So that's my website. It's Instagram. It's Ravelry. It's Facebook. Um, Wonderful. YouTube, you'll find me through that. But my handle there ended up being at Kira Dash Dulaney. Okay. Um, but yeah, again, if you go to YouTube and put in Kira Knitting, you'll probably find me pretty quickly. Wonderful. Yeah. That's so great. If, is there any like final thought you want to leave for the crafty makers of the universe just to encourage them to keep it up? Yeah, and actually even to the people who aren't yet crafty but have stumbled across this, Yeah, I feel like it really is so important for us as humans to make something. Mm. And these days, so much of us, our work is digital. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a tangible thing at the end of the day. And so it's really lovely to make something. Yeah. And even if it's not perfect, and I, this is what I always say at the end of my beginning classes, like if somebody compliments you, say, thank you, I made it. Yeah. And just stop there. Don't point out your mistakes. They're not going to notice them. Mm. Just say, thank you, I made it. And then that might inspire them to make something as well. I love that. Thank you so much, Kira, for being here, sharing some of your story with us and for encouraging others to make and create. Uh, there is something truly powerful about spending your time making something that's tangible and you can hold on to and, and use for a good long time. So I really appreciate it and hopefully I'll see you again soon. All right, that sounds great, I had yeah. fun. Thanks, see you later.